Yeah, so you've been submitting your uh, tough questions to, to these folks, and, and I get to hide behind those kind of spiky words uh, and demand some clean answers. So yeah, let's get straight to it. So uh, this first question, which has been submitted anonymously, which is always a good start. Um, <laughs> add to home screen is pretty good, but it's not in the app launcher. It doesn't show up in battery usage or data usage stats as a separate item. You know, can, we, can we get that? Grace, do you want to start us off with that? It should be on already. Is this working? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're definitely aware of this, and then we try. Uh, we're working hard to try to make the add to home screen behave more like a native app. And there are some complication, like uh, I think mentioned for the battery usage, uh, that we can try to do a better job. But for like a data usage, it's Add to home screen still run inside a browser process. So, and then in Android platform, that's just a single process. We have some challenge to work on. Hmm. But the ultimate goal is to, to make these. Yeah, definitely more like, I mean, in the coming year, what we try to do is make it a more like a native app hmm. from the user perspective. Yeah. So, this, this next question is also uh, anonymous Is Service Worker ready? <laughs> <laughs> what is I, I, I'm, I'm going to, yeah, what, what does the audience think? I don't know. I, I, do, do you think it's ready? Yeah. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, moving on. Well, no, okay, so like we, we've had, you know, 2.2 billion page loads a day uh, through Service Worker um, and 350 million push messages a day as well and, and 2,300 sites using push. And, yeah, okay, it's at the moment Chrome only, um, well, we've Opera support as well and Firefox support, they're hoping to land that uh, early uh, next year, so it's it's on their standards track now. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's pretty ready. But the important thing here is it's progressive enhancement. Like you, you know, pages aren't going to break in uh, browsers that don't have Service Worker. And I think I really think that um, developers are in a position of power here. That if you want to, if you start using Service Worker and you can make you know your sites have more features and run quicker with Service Worker than without it, then for other browsers that's going to show them look. You know, if they want to compete on the web, they need to have Service Worker as well, I reckon. Just what I think. Um, if you want to ask questions during this event, we also have a, a microphone at the, in the middle there. So if you want to ask a question live, then please do come down the, the aisle. It's sort of a, a weird kind of wedding venue, this, isn't it? Especially with all the white chairs. But uh, if you want to ask a question, you can. I'll, I'll go on then, because <laughs> since you've got up, yeah, it's sometimes difficult to find someone who's brave enough to get to the microphone, and that person is you. What is your question? Hi, I'm Paul. Um, first of all, <laughs> <laughs> would you like a job in yeah. DevRel? <laughs> <laughs> the platforms, thank you. Yes. <laughs> a really great, great conference. It's really nice to be here. Um, I have a question because I heard a lot of uh, web APIs and how the web works, but I haven't heard nothing about the Chrome apps and Chrome extensions and this APIs. Is it good? Is it something that's going to happen over there? Is, is it going to be available and so on? Well, we had one question as well. It actually ties in very nicely to the next question we we're going to ask, so we can sort of roll that into one, um, which is when is Chrome OS and Android going to merge, and how soon can we develop apps for that? So, uh, Darren, do you want to take that one? And uh, the question well, yeah, I can talk about all of these things. But um, <clears throat> so, first off, to your question, it's um, Chrome extensions, Chrome apps, these are parts of the platform. These are parts of Chrome. They are, they are things we are invested yeah. When it comes to Chrome extensions, we're, def we're invested in enabling customization of the browser. You're going you're to see us uh, continue to evolve that. What we were here today to, and yesterday to talk about was really um, the things we're doing to enhance the web platform. It was a big focus of Chrome and, and focus on the web itself, the web ecosystem. Um, historically, at this at this at this uh, uh, summit, we've talked about the whole spectrum of things that Chrome's, Chrome's doing, but uh, we really wanted to focus in on progressive web apps, uh, the mobile web, and all the things that can uh, that you guys can do to to um, create great experiences there. Um, when it comes to um, you know, Chrome OS and Android, there was certainly some interesting press recently. I just want to reemphasize that um, 
the, this this idea of Chrome OS being folded into Android, it, it doesn't really compute. It doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, Chrome OS is an extremely successful operating system. Um, if you think about, uh, in particular, where it's been so successful because of the simplicity of the com of the system, because of um, the web, really, it's been uh, a fabulous uh, computing platform for education, businesses, and in many homes. It's a, it's um, really something we started six years ago with this idea of bringing um, the simplicity of computing, speed and simplicity, security, and these these core values, the things that make computing just less less painful, right? Um, to try to try to create a simpler computing experience that people really love, and I think we've been pretty successful here. And Chrome OS is something that's that we're really behind and trying to grow. And, and in particular, um, now now you can totally imagine that as the teams work together, they're going to look for opportunities to leverage across Android and Chrome OS, especially you know under the hood and so on. But you know, as far as how that <coughs> evolves, I think the m number one thing to keep in mind is that that vision, the core user experience of Chrome OS, is a thing that's here to stay, and we're fully fully behind. <laughs> So, oh, okay. yeah, go for it. Just really fast. So, you know, we if, if you look at all the things we're working on on ChromeStatus.com on the open web platform, you'll see a lot of the APIs, or a lot, sorry, a lot of the functionality from the Chrome OS APIs that we're working into the open web, right? I was just in the office uh, earlier this week, and I saw one of the Chrome apps uh, um, engineers with yeah with, with Web USB running, like you know, you know, you know, uh, blinking lights and everything else. Now, there's some. There are some security things that we need to get past on that one, but you know we're we're very focused on 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 bringing all of this functionality to the open web. So Chrome works great um, on new devices like the on the Nexus range and, and things, but in some parts of the world, brand new devices have small screens, half a gig of RAM, and limited storage. How important is it to Chrome to ensure that Chrome works well on these resource limited devices? And and, and what are we doing in this area? Uh, Grace, do you want to take that one? Sure, I would take it again. Uh, so, the, we call the, uh, the low end devices very important for us, right? So, this year we spend a lot of time trying to, especially working on the memory footprint, and uh, we achieved the 30% memory footprint reduction for our browser process. And uh, for, thank you, for the render process, uh, <laughs> we're working on the uh, so that 30% is especially for the low-end devices. We're really targeting that market to try to make sure 512 devices works uh, well. And for render process, we're actually having a cross-the-board effort. It's, I think yesterday I mentioned uh, for the VA to reduce the memory usage, there's uh, like a 10% in the render process. That will be benefit the uh, low-end devices too. And we'll continue looking into what else we can uh, reduce in the coming years. Well, one of the questions I had on, on via email recently uh, is a lot of the devices in uh, you know, they don't have a lot of on-device storage, and a lot of the storage is deferred to SD cards. Uh, are, are we looking at anything to to be able to move uh, Chrome storage, or even for particular origins, move the storage onto the, the SD card? So we are looking into that. Uh, for this, because SD card, IV app can, uh, IV app, if they have the permission to access the uh, st uh, ex external storage, they can access. So we have to ensure user aware the particular uh, local storage data for the origin can be accessed by the other app. And then when, uh, we need to build a, some like a permission model before we can move the data storage to the SD card. Hmm. So this next uh, question is for Parisa, I think, um, and it's quite a pointy question, but um, where are you hiding over there? Um, so I'll read it directly to you, because I think that's, that's how it's supposed to be written. Okay. The deprecation of APIs and features on HTTP is causing developers pain. Why are you <laughs> forcing this upon developers? What are you doing to help make HTTPS easier for developers, especially on intranets? Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, whenever there's an opportunity for pain, I take it. Uh, no. So, <laughs> um, so HTTPS is, is really important. Uh, did anyone see Emily's talk yesterday? Awesome. If you didn't, yeah, it, it is deserving of applause. Uh, so she went over, I think, um, the motivation for this better than, than I'll be able to. But HTTPS is, is really important. Um, without it... Uh, you know, as a user and, and as a developer, um, site owner, you can have no expectation for um, security, right? So uh, for really powerful APIs, um, one of the APIs we, we deprecated recently was um, Get User Media. Uh, so, you know, having access to a, a camera, a device camera, we, we consider very powerful um, and something that really should only be done in a secure context so that um, 
you know, user can have some expectation that the bits they're sending to a site have not been tampered by some third party. And the developer also can have some expectation that, you know, no bits that you're sending to the user have been uh, tampered or, or snooped. Um, so we think HTTPS is really important. Um, we're doing a lot of things to try to ease the path. Um, Emily's talk went over things in the web platform in terms of um, features that we're supporting, uh, as well as um, a new panel that we just um, added to DevTools um, to try to help um, developers who want to support HTTPS to get to, to green. But um, really, it's uh, we think it's, it's the responsibility of us to make sure that really powerful features um, are, are only accessed in a secure context. So we've had a question in from Slack. Yeah, you can answer. Uh, you can ask questions on, on Slack as well, and they get forwarded into this Google Doc I'm looking at. Uh, this question comes from Oliver J. Ash, who's uh, from The Guardian, a developer who did the, uh, the fallback offline crossword page, which I think is brilliant. Um, we've seen a lot of stuff around Service Worker, these new features, push messages, but we're not seeing many Google products using these things. When, when are we going to start seeing Google products such as you know, Gmail, Inbox, uh, Google Plus? When are, when are they going to start using uh, this stuff? Um, I'll direct that one at, at Alex, I reckon. Okay. Uh, so I can't speak on behalf of any of the other Google products, I guess. But just like a lot of, other, a lot of you are experimenting with these technologies and seeing how they can make your uh, things load much quicker, be much more robust to flaky networks, um, I think that these are things that would also make a lot of sense for a number of the Google web properties as well. Um, so although I can't announce anything, I think that, that would make sense. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're kind of seeing uh, on the web a, a resurgence of, of SVG, because uh, SVG's been around for, for, for ages. Uh, I mean, kind of when it started, you know, the spec people or browser developers were going, going to um, web developers saying, hey, do you like Flash? And we're like, not really. Do you like XML? No way. Well, you're going to love SVG because it's basically <laughs> both of those things. But we're looking at uh, deprecating Smile, which is the, the animation sy uh, system. Um, and so we had a question in about that. Um, are we going to break all the existing Smile content uh, out there on the web by uh, removing this from the platform? Dimitri, do you want to take that one? Uh, thank you for not making that question too pointy. <laughs> uh, why, or oh, why, or oh, why are you <laughs> breaking the web? There you go. <laughs> That's more appropriate. Uh, yeah, and the context here is that we did recently, uh, well, not recently, but this spring, uh, started talking about removing a smile, uh, a SVG feature that enables you animation. One of the weird things there is that the reason why we're doing this is because we actually don't see pa the path to interoperability, uh, which is, you know, this working in every browser. And so at this point, like it's you know just a two browser feature and no other browsers want to do this. And so we are sort of like in this really hard situation where we're like, do we carry this along or do we remove it and make you know make our burden a little, a little less? And obviously this involves developer pain and we felt it very hard very much on the blink dev, uh, which is the mailing list where all these things are announced. It's now a sent to thread with people chiming in very regularly, uh, yes. Um, and the, the, the interesting thing there is, uh, I want to say that, first of all, uh, some of the things that Smile does today are simply not uh, easily possible with the web platform features. I think I want us to first get to the point where we can say with full honesty that we can complement the features of Smile with the corresponding web platform features that are on an interoperable path and then maybe talk about deprecation or removing at this point. Uh, at this point, this uh, smile thing thread is mostly a heads up. Look, this is, we know this is not going anywhere. So, you know, take a look. I, I guess part of the plan as well is for the animation API in JavaScript to, to start taking on kind of the, a lot of this stuff. Yeah, web animations is actually one of the kind of interesting parts of that. and. I'm going to do the, it's happening thing. <laughs> so it's actually being implemented across the board. That's really cool. Very excited about that. But there's still some pieces missing. I mean, we're seeing, you know, SVG was unloved for so long. But with uh, you know, devices of different density, uh, especially people are starting to, to pick it up again. But I mean, the, the, the implementation we have still inherits a lot from, from WebKit, the initial implementation. And same for Safari's. Firefox's implementation is old as well. It kind of feels like it's only Internet Explorer and, and therefore Edge that have kind of shown the way with, you know, you can make SVG perform really well. Um, are, are we going to step up our game there? Is that something? Totally. Uh, we're totally stepping up our game. And this is, we're, we want to make 
uh, SVG as performant as, as it can possibly be. I have to say that as a platform developer, it is, I'm amazed that people can use this thing because it's one of the most terrible uh, spec APIs ever. <laughs> and, uh, and there are some places where like you don't want to go in there because bad, bad things will happen to you type of alley situation. And uh, still, like, yet yeah, it is success, success. And it's kind of the story of the web. Uh, the thing that wins is not necessarily the best designed one, right? <laughs> And so, yeah, we, we want to work on this, but we also kind of want to look forward at, ahead to SVG2 and prod that SVG working group along a little bit and say, hey, come on, come on, it's been two years, <laughs> give something. And so get something going there. Uh, so we've got another standards-based question. Um, I'll just read it out as it's, as it's been sent in. Pointer events, seriously, when is it happening? You've been promising it for ages now. Grace, you can have that one. If you check the like a check-in log, it is happening right now as we speak, right? So it is uh, behind the flag, and then I think I see Rick over there, yeah. So he's leading the effort, and then there's a CR bug. I do not recall exactly bug number. If you want to know, you can find Rick after this, and he's you can, right over there. yeah, I see him like <laughs> waving his hand, yeah. So you can follow the bug, and he also has a Twitter feed uh, updating the status, so you can follow him on the Twitter. And today, I believe, it's soon, I think soon, behind the flag, you can uh, try it out. And there are some technical hard things we need to figure it out, so we don't have exactly date. Uh, we're going to turn it on by default. Some Hope sometime soon, when Rick figured it out next year. And please be, please be nice to him. You know, he's a really <laughs> cool fellow, so just take it easy. Uh, by the way, love the way you ask the questions and read them out. Just You have to do this everywhere. Well, we've had a question in from Twitter that's been pasted into this document. And I'd like to thank uh, Paul Kinlan, who's managing this at the moment. Uh, especially thank you for posting every question in using a different font. That's not messing with my OCD <laughs> at all. Uh, this question comes in from Henry Helvetica. Um, <laughs> Could be real name, I don't know. Uh, so the, the way Chrome pushes forward, uh, how do the panel feel about PPK's call to slow down? And um, I'm specifically not allowed to answer this question. I think that's because I've already written blog posts about it. So just a bit of background, uh, PPK um, wrote this, this blog post saying, you know, the, the web platform is progressing too fast and we should stop doing it for like a year. <laughs> for some reason, I'm sitting on the fence <laughs> about this one. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you seem pretty <laughs> yeah. Is it, but, but you know, are we moving too fast on the web? Are, are we making, is, are there mistakes we're making by trying to push the web forward so fast? Um, or should we be moving even faster? Who wants to take that on? <coughs> yeah, so the way that I would measure this is what is the developer, the developer adoption of the new things that we're doing? If, if there's a big gap there, then maybe we are moving too fast. Um, but there are certain things like, you know, if, you know like we, really, we got Service Worker out there really fast because you know, which was really, really fast, but um, the, but you know, this one really fit you, you know uh, um, our model of how we, we want to move forward, which is an ex extensible platform and explaining the platform. Um, so I don't want to just throw in tons of APIs that no one will use. So always looking for that feedback, and that's why we have on Chrome Status all the all of all of the um, histograms and what people are using. Mm -hmm. I think too, if they're uh, for things like Service Worker and a bunch of these other things, we worked very closely with other browser vendors and standards committees and standards bodies. For, for example, with Service Worker, we worked incredibly closely and co-developed that with Mozilla and other members of the standards community. And if other browser vendors are having uh, coming to the table and having meaningful discussion, other people are implementing, developers are using. I think to me that says no, we aren't moving too fast, and we're actually moving at a pretty good pace. And uh, don't forget that if you want to ask uh, a question live here, the, the microphone is just there. Um, you know, someone's already done it, so it's not as scary anymore, right? So <laughs> if anyone's feeling brave, uh, you can come to the front. Um, so, oh, sorry. Go on, go on, carry on. Right now, <laughs> yeah. sing a song. I don't, I don't, don't let me stop you. No, I was, I was just going to say that this whole past year, we've had a real, a real focus on just the core engine and just optimizing existing code paths and you know prioritizing. Uh, you know, scheduling uh, work much better, all to, to bring a lot of wins to the platform. A lot of the V8 improvements came from just being smarter about scheduling. And with the focus on emerging markets, there's been such a focus, uh, uh, such an emphasis placed on being smarter about 
resource loading and scheduling all of this stuff. You have pages with lots of iframes, cross storage on iframes, making sure that the main main document content is given the right priority, et cetera. There's just so much we can do when we really focus on the core engine. So I think part of the answer to the question is, you know, it's not always just about new APIs. Sometimes there's real holes that need to be filled, and that's where something like Service Worker comes in, push notifications, et cetera. But a big part of this is just like making sure the engine works well and that you as developers have a lot of control. The engine shouldn't feel like a big mysterious black box, right? You should feel like you have a lot of control dev tools to help you understand it, et cetera. So there's just a lot of work going into the core platform. And I think that stuff really uh, pays off. I want to refund that a little. And um, I, I actually, PPK's uh, post, uh, I had a little milder response to it than maybe Jake. Um, and basically, my, my, my question, my thing was that if I were to summarize it, I would say the, the, the question he's asking is, to what end? Why are you doing this, right? And I think this is what Greg said, is that you have to be get in order to deliver things that are valuable, you had to get really good to develop, uh, to listen to developers, at listening to developers, understanding what they want, and building something that, is, the question is, are you moving too fast, is like, has such an obvious uh, answer, right? Because it's like, yes, because the developers need it. And this is, like, it's really obvious to me that this is necessary, and that's the next step. And um, I think that's what we've been doing, and I think Darren underlined the, the quality and excellence of the product, uh, focus that we're trying to do in balancing that. Uh, I'm really optimistic about 2016. We are not moving too fast. We are more focused and better than ever. Yay, Web. Well, I, I had an angry response to it, like, like you say, but I, I tried to channel that anger. So um, if anyone's interested in hearing that on the, the latest episode of the HTTP 203 podcast, um, I wrote a five-minute poem about how disgusted I was about this idea that we should stop on the web. So that's something you might want to might check out. Um, yeah, exactly, may as well. I've got a room full of people on a live stream. I'm going to plug my podcast. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, hi, I'm not Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so when there's so many visions and directions for the future of the platform, how do you unify and prioritize all these ideas? So that's a, that's, it's a good question. Let me take a stab at it. I think it's very important for us as a team to have, to pick the battles we want to fight, to pick the problems we want to solve. And uh, so for example, for this year, uh, you've heard some of the themes in this conference. Performance is a big issue on the mobile web. We want to really invest and make appreciable progress on it. Emerging markets and serving the next billion users who come online is a big focus. And so uh, really what we look at is we sort of look at, what's happening out there, look at what users are doing, look at future trends, and then make a very deliberate choice about where to focus our efforts and then align behind that. Um, and then, you know, there's, uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, ideas that come up midstream and you try and incorporate those in, but uh, the idea is not to be spread too thin, so you sort of, you don't want to make 10% progress on a variety of fronts, you want to just nail a few things uh, really well. I would emphasize too that this web platform, it's an ecosystem, it's a community. Uh, that's why all the work we do on Blink is fully in the open. That's why Blink Dev encourages folks to come in and share their perspectives, their feedback on proposals. People float there. Uh, we had our Blink on Contributor Conference last week. We had a whole bunch of folks there uh, from other browser vendors as well. Um, and so it's ultimately by talking to developers. It's by observing places where there's obvious gaps that we're hearing again and again from folks that they need. Uh, but it's ultimately a collaborative process because we're kind of all in this together in a way. Right? i just add one extra thing to that because uh, I think it's challenging, like having to prioritize all these different things you want to do. <clears throat> um, and one thing that's really helpful is Chrome has sort of these guiding principles of simplicity and security. And anytime you, you've, we find ourselves maybe like excited about one idea and getting uh, away from those those core principles, it's it's very helpful to kind of refocus uh, and, and sometimes prioritize. So... Moving on to, to Polymer, does Polymer support progressive web apps? Uh, there seems to be a big emphasis on server-side uh, templating and rendering when it comes to this stuff. Is that something that, that Polymer supports? Matt, uh, yes, so it does. I mean, if you watched Rob's talk yesterday about that, it was building a progressive app in Polymer. Um, so you should probably pay attention <laughs> next time. <laughs> um, 
Good quick answer. But, Fair enough. But no, actually, so I, can, I can elaborate a little bit more on that. So I think, you know, if you look at Paul Lewis's recent blog post about performance on frameworks and how they impact uh, things like Rail, um, you know, Polymer came, came out really well in that comparison. It's relatively small. It's relatively fast. Um, I think there's some things we can do to make that faster and get first paint, paint quicker, and we're working on that right now. Um, but we're already in pretty good shape. And I think, um, you know, when you start to see things like server-side rendering, a lot of the reason for that is because, you know, in certain circumstances, other frameworks have much bigger payloads and much more JavaScript that they're passing down, and you have to do something different on first paint as opposed to later paints. Um, and our goal is to, you know, for Polymer to be really, really fast, have a really fast first paint, and still with idiomatic usage without having to resort to, to tricks like that. But is there, uh, you know, we've got the paper elements that are doing a lot of the, uh, the UI work. Are, are they going to support async? Because that seems to be one of the things that you really need to get this, uh, this kind of first render down. Yep, absolutely. That's some of the stuff we're working on right now. So we've got a question uh, from Slack from uh, Simeon. Uh, so one of the big warts of the, the, the current progressive web app story is that we don't have a good way of handling mixed content um, or cores. And I think what we mean by handling here is, is a, a native app. Uh, can download podcasts, RSS feeds from anywhere on the web. It doesn't have to be cause compatible. And if, if you're wanting to build something like a, a podcast app, you can't really do that on the web at the moment without building your own proxy to send everything through to to not lose the, the you know the padlock or you know to get add cause headers on. And you know some of these, uh, you know, in the case of a podcast app, some of the files are going to be huge in, in doing that. Do we have anything, any ideas on how to address this gap? Parisa, if it's, this is mixed content, do you want to take a stab at this one? Uh, I don't have any great ideas, but it's it's a real problem um, and uh, something we should think about more. I, I, I don't have any great ideas for it. I think it's a, it's a legitimate uh, situation. That one of the requests we get quite a lot is is to say, like, why can't we just make a, a request to anywhere in the web and get the content? Because if we don't put cookies on it, then it's not leaking any data. Um, but the situation we have there is we don't want the web to be able to access things like your local servers. I mean, if you, if you're if an evil page could just do a port scan on localhost and look for sites that are there, I mean, that's basically where you know you'll be running prototype servers, new stuff, stuff that you you don't want leaked onto the web. And, and same goes for intranets as well. So I guess um, with that question, I, mean, I, I don't have any good ideas. Anyone have a good idea? I have a larger thought about the, the importance of the security for the web. We talked a lot uh, yesterday about the importance of the low friction on the web that makes it so easy for users to tap on a link and experience something new. That's so important for that really healthy reach that the web has. And one of the reasons that is true is because of security, because users don't have to be afraid what's going to happen when they tap a link. And so sometimes that means we get things where it's like, ah, we could have done this better if we would have shipped a whole native app. Well, yeah, of course, the security model is different. But that's one of the reasons, the things that ena enables the superpower of the web. So that's one of the, way I think, one of the ways I think of it. So we see, see it as a bug that native allows this sort of stuff to happen. I wouldn't call it a bug. I'm just saying it's a different trade-off in terms of reach. Do you want to ask a question on the mic? Yeah. Hi, my name is Adam. Uh, I have a question about the push notifications. So right now, when the user decides to accept push notifications, the token is bound to a single device. And do you have some plans to synchronize it across all the browsers, or when the user buys a new phone, that uh, they don't have to sign up for the same notifications as before? So we've definitely talked about those kinds of use cases and tried to reason how to do that in a way that uh, makes sense to users and that uh, helps them accomplish the things they want to do. One thing to remember, too, is that when choosing, when a user chooses to enable notifications, it's often very tied to a specific device or context. So I might turn on breaking news alerts uh, on my desktop computer because I'm always looking for something to distract me during the workday. Um, but like I don't want to do it on my phone, necessarily. And so you have to think very carefully about the different user contexts that you'd want to share it. And not to say nothing of the security implications and privacy implications of that. We've definitely talked about it and are, are open, trying to figure out the best way to do that or approach that problem. You could imagine a variety of approaches, you know, with uh, Chrome synchronizing uh, data already between different Chrome instances and so on. And Alex, like Alex said, I think this is something we've talked about, but it, um, in the initial cut, we wanted to keep it simple and focus on the single device case. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we had one question in from Slack. Uh, why does Jake not wear shoes? <laughs> Answer is simple, your shoes, you lose. <laughs> <laughs> 
is V8 actually paying attention to the use ASM uh, flag? Or, or you know, because it used to be we were saying we're going to make just all patterns fast. Uh, so have we changed our, our stance on that? Greg, do you want to take that? So one? sure, I can take that. So uh, V8 over the past year, or actually more than a year, has been working on a brand new compiler that's called TurboFan. This is this is this is to replace the old one, which is called which is called Crankshaft. Anyway, so TurboFan is a type aware compiler, fully fully type aware, um, which means that uh, uh, in the limit, uh, it won't need to look at the use asm uh, uh, you know uh, key at all. It will just be able to infer the uh, you know types and then map it. Uh, and map it internally. However, uh, they are using the use ASM as a trigger to test the to test TurboFan um, as it, as it rolls out, um, and then once it's uh, t once they have t uh, deprecated crankshaft, then they won't look at it anymore. Hmm. So push notifications for apps that have been added to home screen. Um, when you launch a window from from a, a push event, they don't launch uh, in a full screen window. Uh, why is that, and is it something that we can change? Because it, mean, it means you go from this nice native-like experience to something which all of a sudden looks very browser-based. Is there something we can do to fix that? Grace, you want to take this one? Uh, I think that's a good suggestion. So like uh, currently, you can targeting like basically uh, targeting the existing already open the window. So if the at home screen currently is one of the window is open in the background, you can still target it. So I think uh, uh, we should try to make sure even the because at home screen we wanted to uh, work more like a native app. So I think it's making sense for us to be able to target it uh, by the push notification even when it's not running. So. I mean, from a standards point of view, this is something we've been looking at as well. Um, I mean, it's just kind of been ideas that have been thrown around the room so far, but we've been thinking about something like a launch event uh, in a service worker that will be fired um, if there's been a, a kind of launch of a, a, a website done in an ambiguous way. And, and that will include things like you know clicking a home screen icon, clicking a link, clicking a link in the native app. And that will let you decide how to handle that. You know, should it be launched uh, from the home screen? Should it uh, create a new full screen window? You know, so the hope is to let you create um, single window apps or multi window apps uh, using this. And by ambiguous, I mean like if someone long presses and says open a new tab, that's not ambiguous. You know, we, we don't want you to be able to disrupt that, but we want you to have control when the, the launch is 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 ambiguous. Right, OK, um, we've got a, another question from Slack. Um, oh, asking for clarification um, on the ASM bit. Does uh, Chrome do ahead of time compilation like Firefox uh, and Edge for use ASM? I'm not sure about for use ASM, but there is snapshotting going on now. Uh, but I'm not familiar with the latest on what triggers it. I think it's I think it's async or defer on the script tag will will do that I think so I'm not I think we do it for workers as well, so um, I think we're all very excited about Let's Encrypt, um, but Google isn't on the uh, the sponsorship list for it. Is it something we endorse? Is it something we'll be telling developers to use? Do we give it the thumbs up? Is it something we we plan to to sponsor? <laughs> um. I cannot say anything specific about that today, but it's it's a project that we're uh, really excited about and interested in, and that's all I can say today, right now. <laughs> sure. So. You can say we're pretty excited. News to come on that. We're pretty. Ex I said I'm excited, but we're pretty. We're really excited. Oh, okay. we're, we're pretty excited. <laughs> we're we're pretty excited, and yeah, I think it's. How excited are you? Pretty damn excited. <laughs> you see, if you put a big number to that, you'd have got a round of applause. <laughs> so. Lots of zeros at the end. Yeah. Stay tuned. So we've had a, a message come in from Seth Thompson, who was speaking earlier, uh, PM of uh, V8, saying, yes, we, we do have um, reader uh, real ahead of time compilation is coming for Asm.js. Uh, we didn't do it previously, but if you can check that out on uh, chromestatus.com for, for news of that. This one's written in another different font. Guys, you're winding me up. Uh, What's the, name? Uh, the name of what? The font. Arial, Arial. Oh, let's let's check it out. This is um, Alpha Slab. Uh, so this question is this question's written in Alpha Slab. Uh, how will ES 2015 modules affect how we look at web components? Uh, so that's one for Dimitri. Um, so the web components is um, a loose 
congregation of specs, right? And it's been evolving over time. It's evolved quite a bit this year. Uh, as modules get ready to be shipped on the web, I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities that open up for custom elements and imports. And I, I'm really excited about trying to figure out how the how this stuff fits together. And um, especially with imports, um, I sort of want to, like, I've been trying to pitch the idea that we should try to look at the loading mechanism that uh, hasn't yet been fully specced out for ES6 modules uh, for browsers, and then maybe see if we can build, rebuild the imports on top of that and make something amazing happen there. Because the features that modules offer are quite tantalizing for, you know, the whole scoping thing is amazing and the whole export stuff sounds really good. So let's go figure it out. Um, follow public web apps. No, don't go there. But um, yeah, there is a GitHub uh, for W3C web components. It's a pretty active discussion. So lots of interesting conversations there. Oh, would you look at the state of that? This is horrible. It's like reading a kind of, it's, it's like a ransom note it's starting to look like. <laughs> Um, okay, I, so we have a. I watched you changing that around, though. I think. <laughs> yeah. There's a There's kind of fight going, going on. on I'm here, trying to change it. Oh, we've got Comic Sans going on now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, yes, this question is written in Comic Sans. Uh, TC39 has discussed the possibility of adding types in future versions of the language. Is um, TurboFans type support ready to support this uh, possible feature? Uh, yeah, there's, def there's, definite, um, there's definite interest uh, from us in. In working on this, I mean, we are working on it. <laughs> I mean, was there any anything else beyond that? Or? It was just, a, you know, is, is TurboFan got some kind of type support in there? Or is well, yeah, it it's full. It's fully type aware, so it's actually uh, it's like perfect fit for it. So yeah. So it's another one from this is from Unfunk on Slack. Okay. Oh, can I? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm staring too much at the uh, trying to decode the fonts that are going on here. Sorry. Yeah, I gotcha. What what font so. is your question going to be in? <laughs> I think I'll pick the health ticket, of course. <laughs> okay, uh, my question is, uh, I'm Johan. Uh, so I'm building games uh, using SML5, and the problem for me is actually how we can hide if I want to post the score. For example, I built a temple run, and I got the score of the player. I want to post it to the server, but the problem that I always face is uh, like uh, people can just open the dev tools and then just throwing the same request to the server from the JavaScript console, and then they can manipulate this course. So, Well, I mean, surely this must be something, uh, the same problem that native games face, right? Because, the, I mean, the code, the, the, you, know, you can always just put a listener on the wire, something like Wireshark, and see the request being sent and find out where the, the, the score bit is. Um, so it, it, is, 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 that, is that the answer? Or is it, 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 or is, what is like much longer, yeah. right? I mean, sure, you can also you know decompile, uh, you know Java. Yeah. You know, yeah, sorry. I mean, the Java. using using the native is a, it's so, you need another tools, right? Can, can but, you can yeah. you add like a digital signature to the score and then check that on the server too before, and if it's errors, you're like, well, you know, someone's yeah. uh, causing some kind of you know doing some kind of manipulation oh. on it. One idea also come like a Mac, like yeah. adding a Mac to it. One idea also come to my mind is a, uh, is it possible using a web socket like a. Using WebSocket to like a connect between, so it's not like using the post request. I think you probably, st if you're, I think you probably still want to add um, some way to authenticate to to uh, authenticate the actual score. So um, adding a signature for it would would uh, I think help with that because they could still tamper with it um, uh, in your in your client in your game. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, so. We've got a question from Unfunk on, on Slack. What's the best way for developers to provide uh, feedback and make feature requests, not just to Chrome, but also other browser vendors and standards bodies as well? Anyone want to be brave on that one? <laughs> standards bodies. So I think this is a good question. I don't know if there is like an easy way to go and it's like, I would like to propose a feature because um, there is definitely W3C, which is not the easiest uh, working group or group of people to work with. Um, but I think um, some <laughs> did somebody make a face? <laughs> uh, 
but I think there is uh, there is definitely more and more uh, keep, uh, opportunities for developers. I'm going to tout uh, ours, which seems to have worked really well, and this is just Blink Dev. Uh, I think there's a lot of developers listening there, and sometimes just you know putting an idea out is a good good start. And I think as a community of browsers, we do need to get better at engaging developers collectively rather than separately. So I'm going to make a pointed look at, at Darren and Rahul there. Mm -hmm. And and because you know this is a Chrome Dev Summit, but there is people from Microsoft here, here from Mozilla. It's it's a great opportunity. And you're all here, right? So it's um, it's a great opportunity. And we need to get better at this. Yeah, there's also the YCG, uh, the Web Platform Incubation Group. Um, that's a great place to, to propose new things or sort of take, take problems to. Uh, and that's something we at Google use ourselves. The uh, background sync specification is, is part of that uh, movement. So um, what I would always advise, if you're thinking about a new platform feature, try not to think about solving just the, you know, the one problem you have, but what are the parts of that problem? And you know, can we create them all? And so those could be used in different ways to solve other problems as well. Because designing a new web platform API is really, really challenging. There's all kinds of security considerations, other APIs in the platform that you have to fit within, and other semantics that aren't immediately obvious. It does require a fair bit of effort to, to drive into it. However, you'd be surprised the number of times that uh, browser developers and on standards lists, people were making arguments in complete vacuum. And there's developers who actually have very concrete use cases. They've got numbers or examples in the wild that would really help for those conversations. So I think looking for places to give those, that concrete feedback really helps the process. So and this, this is actually a, an issue that's been bugging me recently. When, when pages are launched from the, the home screen and full screen, you, you lose, or the user loses access to the URL bar, uh, which obviously impacts the, the, the being able to share uh, that page or that app. It feels like we're kind of losing one of the core features of the web. Do we have any ideas, any solutions for this? Alex, do you want to take this again? Yeah, let's see. So uh, Flipkart just had a session where they talked about how they, how they put different navigation uh, controls inside the experience once it's added to the home screen. And that is something important uh, that you have to reason about. Like, for example, I remember last, uh, when we had I.O. this past, uh, this past I.O., we had this awesome I.O. web app that when it was on full screen, people would be looking at details on a session and be like, how do, I, how do I share this? Because I know it's got a URL that makes sense. I can share it with people, but I don't know how to do it. And we are like, oh, that's a really good point. How do you do that? And so it's important when you're reasoning through this to, to think about those kinds of affordances. We're also trying to look into how best to support that. So actually, Paul Kinlan's got a, a great post on his, on his site that explains a way of doing this, to, of triggering a native share intent. But it's something that you do have to reason about if you're hiding this browser UI that we've just taken for granted. Do you want to ask a question? This one's a little silly, so I'll make it quick. Uh, my I was wondering if you guys knew of any benchmark that would work really well in my Nexus 6P where I could beat an iPhone 6S. I mean, just anything, any place I could go where I can compete with my friend, not Paul. You can already, you can already use your 6P to beat a, a, an iPhone, just actually physically beat it <laughs> on the screen. That's about all I can um, do. That's and then the your friend's iPhone will run a lot hey, slower. Yeah. How about, how about loadflipcart.com? What was that? Loadflipcart.com. Load? The best benchmark is something yep. that you, affects users, not in a vacuum. Will I win, though? Have you tried that one out? Because uh, if, if, if he's going to see this, and if I, if I lose at this one, too, it's really going to be embarrassing. So I, I, an app that, that I built, I can, I can plug loads of things. It's great. Uh, SVG OMG, which is a kind of SVG optimization thing. Once the service work is there, you, know, you revisit that, and that loads in 100 milliseconds flat. Um, and that's using Service Worker. So on devices that don't have Service Worker, um, especially if you're on something like 3G, which has like 1.7 seconds worth of connection set up, that's what it's going to be on an iPhone. So you know, find somewhere with, with 3G or 4G and set, uh, like especially the second load, or from a home screen launch of SVG or MG on both. So I really you, you will win by almost two seconds. Win. Hmm, sorry. So, so I really so got to game it to win. So yeah. I think what Greg, to layer into what Greg was saying is, uh, Benchmarks are really finicky, depending on the precise characteristics of the device and what kinds of, just lots of different things. Well, that's why I want one that where I can win. <laughs> but so, but that, that's why I think that Rails is an interesting way of looking at it. What ultimately matters is the user experience and performance. And that allows things like service workers and other things that have a really important 
impact on it. Yeah, and I wouldn't say loading uh, using like, you know, caches and things and service work. I don't think that's gaming it. I think that is, that is what we want the future of the web to do. We, you know, we want like, you know, when users go back to something they're used to, that it appears instantly and they see content that, and maybe even in future content that they haven't even seen yet using sort of background sync and things. And yeah, this is stuff that, that Chrome is, uh, is way So ahead Google's on. given us slower devices so that we can be better developers. Is I, that the I, is it? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> is it slower? It's definitely slower. It's definitely slower. I oh, mean, just well. raw JavaScript performance, it's a lot slower. Well, it's Android Dev Summit, isn't it, soon? Is that next <laughs> week? You can uh, take that one to the... <laughs> um, we've got a question from Slack from, Kim, uh, from Tim Kadlec. Uh, data Saver is awesome and necessary, um, and it, but it's understandably bypassed on HTTPS, making it conflict with the security everywhere goal. Uh, both are super important. But what's being done, done to balance security with the fact that many people need to use these proxy services for uh, speedy access? Parisa, do you want to take this one on? I did say the word security. This is about data saver. This is data saver. It doesn't work over HTTPS, understandably. Uh, should it? Or um, is, is it something that's going to die out as we push HTTPS across the, the web? Is data um it's a hard, it's a hard, that's a hard question. Um, so uh, we have a long ways to go for all of the web to have full HTTPS adoption. So um, it would be nice if I could blink and say that that's going to be a problem we immediately need to fix today. And my, my kind of hope is that actually the um, needs for data saver are going to at the same time go away. Um, and you, you look like you have something on your tongue. No, no, go for it. <laughs> finish, finish. Uh, uh, and and so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, you know, uh, HTTPS is going to get faster. Networks are going to get better. Our performance on bad networks is going to get better. And the need for data saver will at some point not be there anymore. So um, we're thoughtful to, to this. I think we are uh, really, I uh, care about HTTPS. I also care about people being able to use the web in, in networks where I, I, I recognize that it's not a uh, experience and it actually impacts things. So I think we're exploring how to make this better. The, the real promise of HTTPS is the endpoint security. And so we really are being thoughtful about that. Yeah, also note that you know, Data Saver currently is implemented as a proxy service, right? Which is why all these thorny questions come up. You could imagine that the same transforms could be applied at the origin server. Tal mentioned briefly uh, page speed, which does some of this work. Um, so you can imagine other ways to solve this data compression problem without running into a proxy service uh, dealing with HTTPS traffic. And in addition, just designing the web application to be smarter about how it, t how it uses the network. You know, Flipkart's the great example here, right? Leveraging service worker, being, being smart about the initial payloads, being smart about bringing down um, content uh, only when needed and in the background caching it and so on. Um, all of those things uh, really can pay off here to the point where, as Persa said, a feature like Data Saver isn't really needed. And so Data Saver is really there as a, as a tool to help users access the web, uh, the web that, as it exists today. But as developers, we can all change the, the web. We can evolve it. We can, we can make it better. We can make it so that uh, things like HTTPS uh, work great. Yeah. And, and I think to uh, maybe one, I don't know if this was implied by the question, but why not just have Data Saver support HTTPS? And, and that's, a challenging, that's a challenge as well, too, because uh, as, as Rahul said, it's, it's a proxy. And, and there's, SSL offers that end-to-end -end connection, and we as Google don't want to <laughs> interfere with that. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. Uh, train, house, river, skull and crossbones. That question was written in Windings. Thank you very much to the people <laughs> operating that document. Uh, we have a question on the mic. Uh, can you speak to us specifically about service worker and security uh, for, say, for like a banking application or uh, retail as well? Um, is it just tell the security folks it's HTTPS and we can just be okay with that? Or well, if your bank website is not HTTPS, then leave that bank. <laughs> would be my first advice. I don't work for a bank. <laughs> Uh, and it, what, what security issues are you, are you concerned about with this? I work for Target, and they had security issues. I think everybody knows about that. But so uh, in order to, to utilize this, which we're planning on, um, what do we give to the security folks? Because they've never heard of it before. Um, so they're going to have questions about it. And in large corporations like that, it can take months and months for those people to catch up to these things. Um, could there be like a white paper that says, here's what you need to know right now? Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah, we yes. should do that. 
I'm, <laughs> yes, I'm looking at Alex Russell. He's like writing the white paper up as as <laughs> as as we as we type. But he's the sec the service worker security person. Yes, it'll be done probably by the end. I mean, we got okay. nine minutes. I'll, so. I'll meet you at the front door. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We have another uh, service worker question here. Exciting possibilities with service worker, but is an empty app shell a sensible starting point to progressively enhance from? Is there a strategy to better avoid serving a page without content until JavaScript successfully intervenes? Uh, that's from Phil Hawksworth. Thank you. He used to be my boss. You could have asked a kinder question. Uh, does anyone want to take that? I mean, I could take that. I'll take that. Um, <laughs> the serving the app shell, I mean, currently using the, the app shell approach, you're going to get a result much quicker than you would um, by going to the network, even with server rendering. And we've, we've proved that out. Um, one website you can look at is if you search for offline Wikipedia as a, a demo I built, and you can sort of set different flags to you know, server render or not server render or user service worker. And you can put those results through um, web page tests yourself and, and, and see what the, the effects are. But one thing that I'm excited about, and this will start landing uh, early next year, is streams arriving uh, within the service worker. These are streams that you can construct yourself. And the, the technique that I'm really looking forward to using is where you would um, serve the header of the page, you know, including like a kind of first render uh, toolbar and things, serve that from the cache, and then start streaming content from the network. And if that stream takes a while, you can start serving a, a different stream. So in, in that model, your service worker becomes the server, and you are serving um, one response with, with HTML in it. And I think that's, that's a really interesting pattern. Uh, that's something that Wikipedia have expressed interest in, because it, it matches much closer what they do on the server, and they can start sharing code between the, the server and the service worker. Oh, you, you have a question? Do you want to? So uh, most web technologies that we've worked with have the ability to do some degree of progressive enhancement, but service worker is very much a your browser does it or it doesn't. Uh, how would you suggest building an application that needs to support browsers that don't have service worker without just writing the application twice? Yeah, do you want me to do that again? Oh, I'm going to just be. I mean, I'll just add a bit here. Actually, I think I feel like Service Worker was designed to be very complementary. Like, you can take an existing web application and add on a Service Worker that's going to be able to intercept the network requests that your page makes. You're not having to rejigger your page dramatically to start benefiting from Service Worker. Of course, you can go even further, but like, compare that to sort of uh, older. Uh, other techniques like using app cache, where you really did have to be uh, uh, redesigning the way your page worked. Or if you were trying to use local storage to serve your resources and XML HTTP requests to fetch them, there you're very much uh, redesigning your page for, for that technology, that, that sort of serving architecture. But here you can take an ordinary web page with URLs and start to capture them into caches and so on. I guess I'm talking less about the case where you're just using Service Worker as a caching acceleration mechanism for resource requests and more you know, the additional features or additional logic that may get pushed into Service Worker. I mean, push notifications already yeah. use that. Other things will start using that. I think that's a good point. And you can imagine that you might need to, you might want to uh, you know, build a framework that allows you to take some of the code that would, you know, to modularize so the code that you want to have in the Service Worker could also run in the main document when you're, uh, you don't have the Service Worker as a context. You know. um, but some of that's probably things, I mean, these patterns are things for us to figure out, I think. Uh, for us as a community to figure out. Yeah, all of the examples that we, that we saw over the last two days using Service Worker, they work uh, on browsers that don't have Service Worker. They just work better on, on browsers that do. Yeah, one of, the, one of the best examples that I've seen of this is at Google I.O. 2014, the talk that you and Alex gave with the uh, Game of Thrones, I think. No, yes, or, uh, it yes. was Harry Potter, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those things. Anyway. You guys started out with big difference there, Greg. <laughs> no, sorry, I don't. I don't know either of them. But fool of a uh, took. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm so embarrassed for you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, where you guys had a very, you guys started out with a non-service worker site, and then in the course of like it, over like 20 minutes, you converted it into offline, cacheable, and everything. And it was really, really magical to see, actually. So you can go back and stream that off, off of YouTube. 
Uh, and um, I mean, it is possible to create a site that depends on service worker, but we made it, you know, so you, you have to jump through hoops in order to do it. Like you would load, uh, your, the thing you served from your server would be a loading page, and then you set up the caches in the service worker, and then once they're ready, you refresh the page, and then it can intercept it and serve something different. Uh, but it's, you know, we've made that deliberately difficult, but, and if you, you know, you can do that if you, if you want to, um, but I will hunt you down, because I don't think that's the right way to build websites. Um, we have another question on the microphone. Yeah, this time about service workers. <laughs> Uh, so, how service uh, um, how service workers caching the app shell um, and serving the content via API uh, have to do with uh, ICO? How it's gonna work with ICO? Is the is the search engine will see the content in the in this case? I, How's the about the app visibility? I, I think it's a very similar answer to before. If if you're um, if you're using service workers and enhancements, you know the user lands on the page and there's a, you know, you're serving content, and then on the next load of the service worker, you can do things with the caches. You know, there, in terms of how Google's web search sees your site, it's exactly the same, and there's no SEO impact. Yeah, if you start making things depend on service worker, at the moment, you will impact SEO. If we see a lot of people doing that, then, you know, we'll look at ways of fixing that, but there's nothing in there at the moment. Okay, so basically, it's all about uh, progressive en enhancement. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, that was service worker was built with progressive enhancement in mind from the start. Remember the the first load of the site that supports service worker doesn't use service worker, right? Right. So there's going to be a breakout session on service worker um, after the event. So, <laughs> and I still have a little bit of energy left, so I could probably do a, a, a Q and A on that. So I'll, I'll kind of. Why don't we it. take another service worker question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are getting off lightly with this. So, it's, um, so um, when will add to home screen be on desktop? Uh, is a question we've had, because it's really annoying that mobile is pushing forwards here uh, and the desktop is being left behind. Uh, Rahul, do you want to uh, take that one on? Sure, I can take a stab at it. Um, we are looking at it. Uh, we are experimenting. We're, you know, on desktop, I think, in diff uh, which is, is different from mobile in the sense that on mobile, a common user pattern is going to the home screen, launching an icon, and so bringing that to the web, I think, was, was, a, was, a, was a reasonable thing to do because you're in the user flow. On desktop, it's a b bit more of a mixed bag. Uh, there's much more sort of established patterns of behavior. We need to be thoughtful about how we want users to change that behavior. Uh, and so we're looking at it, and we'll, we'll figure out, we'll, we'll, we'll try some things out, and we'll see how they work, and then uh, make progress there. I mean, since the beginning of time, Chrome's had, the, or since the beginning of Chrome, Chrome has had a um, create <laughs> application shortcut feature, which is essentially add to home screen. It's just not something that we, we have um, we, that we are promoting in the same way that we we're promoting it on, on mobile, where the, the, you see the banner show up and so on. But it's, as Rahul says, something we're looking into. So I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I keep saying guys when I'm referring to groups of people, so I apologize for that. I'm going to blame being in America, because I don't do that back home, right? I, I always say folks, I say folks. So uh, Something has gone very wrong in my brain, so I apologize for that. Um, another question. Angular is the largest front-end framework currently. Why does the Chrome dev team not include them more in demos? Uh, you, know, you would increase your target uh, reach audience by several orders of magnitude. Uh, Matt should probably take that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got a minute and 18 seconds to do this one. Um, so yeah, so uh, I've been doing this for a really long time. I've been in the web UI world for a really long time. Uh, so you see a lot of patterns emerge. So there's always about every two or three years one or two years, there's a, a new hot thing that everyone sort of gets excited about. Um, so you know, right now, it's actually probably React more than Angular. Um, I'd say Angular is probably the last one a couple of years ago. Um, and you know, and honestly, from the web developer's perspective, this is great. These are all great choices. Um, the fact that you actually have a choice on the web as opposed to native is a really, really good thing. And you can find a framework that actually really suits you. And that's really awesome. And I'd much, much rather have someone you know, build an app in Angular than build a native app, frankly. Um, you know, I really want the web to win. Um, and, you know, from the perspective of framework developers, um, you know, because I was one previously, um, you know, the web platform is this thing that doesn't really do what you want and that you can never change. Um, so they build all these big abstractions um, and, you know, bring their own platform and bring their own programming model to the table. Um, and it ends up being kind of an interesting thing. Um, and it ends up being really successful, right? And part of our job in Chrome is to make those things run really, really fast. Um, but Polymer is pretty different than that. And you know, when we first showed up to work on Polymer, before it was known as Polymer, you know, Darren and Dimitri sat us down and said, OK, you know, 
here is these new primitives, web components. You know, you have to make something out of this. Um, it has to be idiomatic. You have to use the platform in the most idiomatic way, and it has to be really, really thin. And if something's broken, you have to tell us so we can fix it. So you know, that sort of framework assumption was incorrect for us. We were actually allowed to change the platform. We were part of the platform. Um, and so what happened is Polymer ended up being very different, right? We use DOM as the framework. We don't build a whole big framework. Um, you know, apps built in Polymer don't have a really big JS payload. Um, and they're really, really fast as a result. And we can innovate on them on a native level. Um, so you know, in the end up, Polymer was ending up just kind of an extension of the native platform, OK? And it was part of, and we're physically part of the team as well. Um, so I think it ends up, that's why Polymer is different. That's why we're part of the web platform. That's why you see us here. That's why you see us at I.O. Um, and that's why we're focused on it. And that is all we have time for. So thank you very much to the panel. Greg Simon, Darren Fisher, Grace Klober, Rahul Roll, Roy Chowdhury. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. 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 <laughs> and some other people. <laughs> Dmitry Glaskov, Alex Komorowski, Mac McNulty, and Prisa Tabriz. A big hand for these folks. Thank you very much. Thank you.